My name is Kendra Henry, and I'm one of the Veterans Appointment Representatives at Job Service North Dakota. And I'd like to give you some more information on how to be, be, go from being a veteran-friendly employer to being a veteran ready employer. Now, the first thing we should talk about is the definition of readiness. I realize that this does tend to be actually a piece of military jargon, even though we at the Department of Labor use it all of the time, especially when it comes to things like the Higher Effects Medallion Program, we'll talk about being veteran ready instead of veteran friendly. What military readiness means is ensuring that you have the proper planning, training, and tools in place for, military, for mission success. Yes, that is a picture of me from when I was 20 years old. I had just finished all of my training and finally got up to Grand Cox Air Force Base ready to start my job, just to be told that I needed to go through even more training and learn how to be security forces, which is the Air Force's version of military police or infantry. I was a little bit upset by this because I had spent the last two years of my life doing everything I could to not have to be security forces. But it was explained to us that they wanted everybody to have this training that way in the event that all of their actual security forces members needed to respond to something quickly in force, those of us would have the training be ready to step in and fill some of those gaps in to ensure success in the mission. So being veteran ready when it comes to employment is very much the same. My name is Kendra Henry, and I am one of the Veterans Employment Representatives here at Job Service North Dakota. Here are some tips to help you become less of a veteran-friendly and more of a veteran-ready employer. Let's talk about the branches of the military. You have six main branches of the military. If you're in the Air Force, you're an airman. If you're in the Army, you're a soldier. If you're in the Navy, you're a sailor. If you're in the Marine Corps, you're a Marine. If you're in the Space Force, you're a Guardian. And if you're in the Coast Guard, you're a Coast Guardsman. A couple of additional items to take note of is the Space Force falls under the Department of the Air Force, which like the Marine Corps falls under the Department of the Navy. The Coast Guard falls under the Department of Homeland Security, though prior to 9-11 they belong to the Department of Transportation. So they will have a very much unique mission set compared to the other branches. One other thing to take note here is all of these terms are gender neutral. It is always air man, not air woman, just like it is guardsman, not guardswoman. Outside of our six main branches of the military, we also have our guard and reserve components. Each branch has their own reserve component, um, as well as you have the Army and Air National Guard. They will have a more unique resume and work history set, comparatively speaking, at times, because they will go through all of their military training, go to their guard or reserve weekend, potentially be activated on different orders, but they will also have a day civilian job. So they may have two wildly different pieces of work history occurring at the same time on their resume. Something else to keep in mind about the National Guard is they actually are assigned to the state, not the federal government. So they both can be activated by the governor of the state they belong to, as well as the federal government orders. This does cause a little bit of confusion when it comes to things like veterans preference. My name is Kendra Henry, and I am one of the veteran employment representatives here at Job Service North Dakota, with some tips on how to move from being a veteran friendly employer to being a veteran ready employer. Let's talk about military organizational structure. If you look at the slide, I have an example here. It kind of has a breakdown of different military terms per branch on the different size of unit that they are working for. And so they kind of make compare us into civilian. Uh, workforce sides. Um, it would be a little bit easier when you come across these resumes. So two to three individuals is going to be a team or an element. Six to ten in the Army and Marines is a squad. Sixteen to ninety platoon in the Army and Marines. Task element in the Navy. In the Air Force that will be a flight. 100 to 200 individuals is a company in the Army and Marines. Task unit in the Navy. And a squadron for the Air Force and the Space Force going to be compared to a group in civilian terms. A thousand plus, you've got a battalion in the Army and the Marines, a task group in the Navy, a group in the Air Force, and a Delta in the Space Force. That's going to be talking generically about your organization in civilian terms. Three thousand plus, a brigade or a regiment in the Army and Marines, a task force in the Navy, a wing in the Air Force, a command or a field command in the Space Force, and a subdivision in civilian terms. Ten thousand plus, it's going to be a division in the Army and the Marines, 
a fleet or a command from the Navy, a numbered Air Force in the Air Force, and that's going to be similar to a division in civilian translation. You may hear terms like shop or unit as a generic term when people are trying to describe their work center or the number of, or the number of group of individuals that they led or worked with. If you hear terms like installation, base, post, those kind of things, those are going to be more referring to the physical location versus the size of the unit. Units can also be geographically separated by state or even country. For example, the squadron that an airman serve under may report to a group in a completely different state. My name is Kendra Henry, and I am a Veterans Employment Representative here at Job Service North Dakota with tips on how to move from being a veteran friendly to a veteran ready employer. Let's talk about military rank structure. I'm going to be perfectly honest. Between the branches, we don't even necessarily know everyone's rank titles. You'll know your own, maybe some folks that you work closely with in another service. So it's not necessarily uh, a problem if you don't know the difference between all the different sergeants or different job titles. Um, what is easiest for even us in the military is to ask for pay grade. Pay grades are going to be the same across the board and can cut down on confusion. Especially for things like uh, when they have the same rank title, but they're not necessarily the same pay grade between services. For example, a staff sergeant in the Air Force is an E5 while it's an E6 in the Army. And that doesn't seem like too much of a big deal because those two pay grades serve similar purposes. However, in every branch of the Navy, a captain is an O3, while in the Navy, there are no six, and that's a big difference in responsibilities. So if you're trying to figure out what somebody's rank means, it um, might be best just to ask for their pay grade. You have two different pay scales. You have the E, or enlisted scale, and the O, the officer scale. There also are warrant officers in certain branches, and they are their own pay scale and serve their own different duties and responsibilities. On the enlisted scale, your E1 to E3 is basically going to be your generic grunt. These individuals have, um, at a minimum, graduated high school, have got their GED, and are brand new to the military. They are just learning their job, they've just gotten through school, and they're just still trying to figure everything out, and they're going to do a lot of that frontline labor. Um, now you can advance in rank early, so say you did four years of JROTC or an Eagle Scout, or have a college degree, you might be bumped up from being that E1 to an E2 or an E3 before proving to your duty station. Your E4s are kind of unique, so they're still very new to the military, but they are able to work independently with less supervision, and they may start to supervise, whether that be as a shift leader or even as a uh, frontline supervisor with direct reports if they have the proper training. E5 and E6, these are going to be your frontline supervisors. They're going to be subject matter experts in their fields, um, doing less of the field work and more of the supervision tasks. So they can be vectored to additional duties such as training management, dorm management, drill instructor, uh, training instructor, those kind of those kind of positions. So they may start stepping out of their career field and taking on additional duties and responsibilities. Your E7 through your E9 are going to be your senior enlisted or your senior supervision. So they're going to be supervising large groups of individuals that flight or even upwards on higher up on the squadron piece. Um, they will also be taking on other additional duties. One of those would be the first sergeant. The Air Force Russell refers to them as their first shirt. And this is going to be similar to the military equivalent of a human resources individual. However, there are still a lot, it's not a one for one transition. They are going to be the advocate for the enlisted personnel when it comes to their, to their officers, as well as dealing with different personnel issues. On the officer side, it's still going to be very similar. Your O1 to your O3, these individuals are going to be new to the military, potentially recent college graduates. The requirement for becoming an officer is that they have to have at least a bachelor's degree, master's if they are a chaplain, and have gone through either officer candidate school, ROTC, um, or one of the academies. 
um, 04, 05, 06, as, as they advance in rank, they're going to be taking on larger and larger commands, larger and larger duties and responsibilities. While your 01 to 03 may be supervising at the flight or squadron level, your 05, 06, you're going to be taking on that squadron group, larger units. Um, generals are going to be few and far between and be overseeing those regiments, those number of air forces, etc. My name is Kendra Henry and I'm one of the veteran representatives here at Job Search North Dakota. And I'm going to give you some tips on how to move from being a veteran family to being a veteran ready employer. Talk about job specialty codes. In addition to their rank and pay grade, the military member is going to have a job specialty code. This is going to be an alphanumeric code that is used to define what their main duty is in the military. Start with the Air Force. This is going to be a five or six digit alphanumeric code um, that breaks down what their code code is. Now, you don't necessarily have to be an expert on what all these numbers mean, what these letters mean. You just have to be aware of if the big thing is going to be that fourth digit, which is their skill level, which is going to be broken down very similar to the craftsman titles. So helper, apprentice, journeyman, craftsman, superintendent. And each one of those comes with, more, with additional classroom training and hands-on training as well. Um, even in the Air Force, we don't necessarily know everybody's AFCs um, outside of our own fields. If you look at the picture I have there, that's a picture of my dad pending my maintenance badge on me. Because at the time where I graduated communications maintenance school, we wore the same maintenance badge as a field maintenance, which is what my father was. Um, later on, that it was updated and Cyber got their own designation and their own badges. So these do change from time to time. Um, so one Cyber Troop may tell you one definition and a different Cyber Troop may tell you something different as these grow and change. The Army and the Marine Corps, they have a three or uh, four digit alphanumeric code very similar. It's going to be the number designates their basic career and the letter is going to designate their specialty. So as you see the example for the Army, 18 means Special Forces, Delta means Medic. So they'd be a Medic in the Special Forces. The Navies gets a little unique because they do tie it to their rank. So you may have very similar to the Air Force in terminology, they're going to have that apprenticeship or than that um, in advance from there. So they may refer to themselves as a corpsman, a hospitalman, even an airman. Yes, in the Navy, they have airmen. And do keep in mind that all of these terms are gender neutral. If you get some of this information on a resume and you're not sure what to do with it and you want to know more information maybe about this individual's career field, I suggest going to ONET Online. This is the tool I use when I'm working with service members on building their resumes or doing career exploration. Right there on the landing page, you'll see a, pay, a spot that says Attention Veterans. Uh, you're able to enter a branch and their MOS or AFC and it will kick out a description of different jobs in the civilian sector that are very similar to what their job was in the military. And it does actually use retired AFCs as well. Um, after I left the military, my 3D172, which I used the example here, got retired and merged into a different career field. So whether it is the most current um, job specialty code or an older one, this will give you the information on it. And it does a really nice breakdown of what type of day-to-day -day tasks they would have done in that field. Now it's not 100% accurate. Uh, some career fields like 11 Bravo, also known as infantry, are not necessarily going to have an exact one-for-one -one translation over into the civilian sector, but it will be able to give you information on very transferable skills that they would have developed within that career field. My name is Kendra Henry and I'm one of the veterans and I'm here at Job Service North Dakota and I have some tips on how to move from being a veteran to being a veteran. Let's talk about military awards and decorations. 
Now generally when I'm working with a veteran on their resume, I advise not to just list uh, the awards and benefits that they've received uh, from their time in the military. However, when going above and beyond the minimum, it is nice to be recognized for something that you've accomplished. That achievement medal that they share with you may be an example of the time they streamlined the process or when calm under pressure. There will be a good story behind it, not perfect for their interview. But feel free to ask questions about it. You must keep in mind as each veteran may put different value on their awards and operations than others would. My father in law's retired from Bray. Before that, he was the jump master of the 82nd Airborne. This man is literally G.I. Joe. And when he showed me his ribbon rack, when I first met him, he was showing me his entire 20 plus years of military history in front of me. The one he pointed out to me and was most proud of was his good conduct ribbon, which ended was completely maxed out, which meant he made it all the way to his retirement with a single disciplinary action. He's very proud of that. Though most people would think that was about the least of his accomplishments compared to everything else. I myself have two ribbons I keep on my name tag. These two are literal participation trophies. One is my National Defense ribbon. One is my uh, Global War and Terror Expeditionary ribbon. These were gifts from a fellow veteran of me at mine um, because they wanted to make sure that as a female veteran, I was seen. Um, so not only does it say that I served my country, it shows that I deployed as well. And so those ones do have value to me, even though they're not necessarily the highest value ribbon on my ribbon rack. So those are kind of the things to keep in mind. If the veteran does share this information with you on a resume, ask questions and hear the story behind uh, why they're wanting to share this information from you. You get a good story, a good example of their leadership or their thinking fast on their feet or their resilience. My name is Kendra Henry, and I'm one of the veteran representatives here at Job Service for Dakota. With some tips on how to move from being a veteran friendly to being a veteran ready employer. Let's talk about understanding military work history. The quote I have on the screen right now is from the movie Good Morning Vietnam. When Robin Williams' character says this, he is hyperbolizing and making fun of how many acronyms and how much jargon is used when the military speaks to each other. I find it funny because that's exactly what we sound like when we talk to each other. Excuse me, sir, seeing how the VP is such a VIP, shouldn't we keep it the PC on the QT? Because if it leaks out to the VC, we could end up in MIA and we'd all end up getting put out on KP, okay? Makes perfect sense to me and that's why I find it funny. I think other people find it funny because it sounds like gibberish to them. So how do we take a statement like that and make it make sense when it comes to work history? Here are some common military terms and phrases, and what's funny about this list when I was putting together the slideshow is you can tell that this is clearly made for military members because they don't define what the military term means and they just give a civilian equivalent. Things like PCS, that means permanent change of station, and as you see, as the definitions are relocation or remove. Um, MOS, MOC, AFC, we just discussed those in the previous video. Um, that is our career field or especially battalion unit, platoon wing, organizational structures again. Um, a TDY or a TAD is temporary duty, so that's going to be a business trip. Different things like this um, can often be found their way into military jargon. They can be kind of hard to re explain to someone when trying to translate this onto a resume. Here's some examples of Air Force writing. Yes, I went to school to learn how to write like this. Um, you can see the structure here is very similar to what you would see on a resume. A couple to, uh, starts with a verb, has the action statement, um, and as well as an impact statement. A couple differences here is they had to be exactly that length of the box. They cannot be longer, they cannot be shorter. And it was generally considered um, poor format to reuse the same verb in the document more than once. So I have experienced some very unique terms um, when it comes to performance report writing, both in my experience as a 
military supervisor, as well as in this position as veteran representative and trying to help other individuals write their resumes. Words like honchoed or quarterbacked will often show up because they can't find a new verb they haven't already used to describe that form of leadership that they are trying to convey. Um, the first two examples here are actually from my old career field. Um, I was in IT in the military. So uh, on top of having your military jargon in there, you also have some information technology jargon in there. Just like any other career field, there's going to be terms and phrases that someone outside the career field may not understand. So the trick is both the t um, redefining that military phrasing as well as that career field jargon, especially if you're someone like me who changed career fields. Um, I generally would recommend individuals come see someone like me before submitting their resume to employers. However, if you get this before someone like me sees that, feel free to just ask questions and they will more, be more than happy to define what these mission elements are to you. My name is Kendra Henry, and I'm a veteran friendly representative here at Job Service Arkansas. With some tips on how to move from just being a veteran friendly to being a veteran friendly ready employee. Let's talk about job hopping. Quite often, when you get a resume of someone who's freshly out of the military, you're going to have a lot of different job titles, a lot of different locations listed, and as a civilian employer, the family will post that they have quit and started a bunch of different jobs over the past 5, 10, 20 years. Um, that's not necessarily the case. Um, here's some terms I want to define for you. PCS, the Permanent Change Station. This means when you get orders and you upload your whole life and you move to a new duty location. This could be a state away, this could be a country away. Sometimes they volunteer for it, but sometimes it's just for the needs of the military take them. TDY or a temporary duty, this is anything less than six months. Um, and think of it more like a business trip. They may be sent somewhere for training, they may be sent somewhere to support a mission. Um, members of my shop here when I was stationed at Grand Forks Air Force Base were at one point sent to Minot Air Force Base to help restore communications lines after a flood. That was considered a TDY. And while they were doing their main job at a different location, they may want to describe it as such. A deployment. This is going to be six months to a year, depending on your branch, um, and this is going to be very similar to being you're still going to be assigned to your home duty station, um, but you are going to be being sent to an expeditionary location. It doesn't necessarily mean the the hot zone of a war, but it's going to be a support of that conflict. Short or long tours. Uh, these are going to be assignments of a year to two years in a location where sometimes it's hard for them to staff people. Korea and Turkey are the ones that come to mind for me. And then you have additional duties. Um, and these can be things that you do alongside your day-to-day -day work, or they can take you out of your workshop in your career field to have you doing something completely different. This could be quality assurance, tool monitor, vehicle maintenance. Um, for myself, I was a training manager for a couple of years. So I moved outside of my job as a network technician and was responsible for all the different types of training that my unit was required to accomplish, both for their upskilling and just for their general readiness. And so for a couple of years there, I didn't work in IT on the same base that I'd always been on, but I was in a completely different job. Um, the reason you see a lot of this is it comes down to a few factors. It's going to come down to the individual's rank, um, job specialty code, deployment bucket, and even their gender. Uh, they may be looking for a female NCO, E5, E6, to assist with uh, drug test duty. You know, it happened to me once a year ever since I set on to became a supervisor. Um, they may need five E3s who are available to deploy in December. Um, the military views us as pieces of equipment, not in any type of derogatory way, but they treat us the same way and they may get the right pieces in the right places to ensure mission success. 
Now, why is this a strength? Um, while job hopping may look um, like a red flag in civilian employment, for us it means that we're able to think on our feet, we're flexible, we're adaptable, we can learn new tasks quite quickly and on the fly. We can jump into a, we can jump into an assignment and build it from the ground up if we need to. Um, we are great teamwork because we have to rely on our um, new team to figure out what's going on, move forward. Um, it's good leadership skills, you know, because you're going to listen and learn from your team. You're going to make good decisions to help them listen and learn. Um, these are all very much advantages for the style of um, being adaptable and moving from job to job, assignment to assignment. Now, when on the job training and resilience aren't enough, there are plenty of upskilling opportunities um, for military members and veterans. First, you have the GI Bill. You know, many people are familiar with this one. It's been around since World War II. Um, basically, it's a college scholarship um, that the veteran can use to go to school for any sort of degree or certain certifications tracks as long as the educational institution is partnered with this program. A little lesser known one is the Veterans Readiness and, and Employment Program, known as VRE. It also formerly was known as Folk Rehab or Vocational Rehabilitation, but a few years back they kind of rebranded to not be confused with State Vocational Rehabilitation Services. This one's actually been around since World War, after World War I for similar purposes. It's supposed to help the disabled veterans um, with vocational training. So this can be, again, classroom training, college degrees, guild trades, certification tracks, et cetera, to help them bridge that gap of skills that they need. As a job service employee, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, known as WIOA. Um, recently, several service members or other veterans may qualify for this program. Um, as we can provide that reimbursement for on-the-job training to the employer or assist them with classroom training in a demand occupation for the state. We also have SkillBridge. This is going to be for the separating service member. They can be granted um, up to six months of what we would call permissive TDY or permissive temporary duty where basically they're released from their job up to six months early to start working for an employer and getting a lot of those on the job training skills that they would need to be successful in the workforce. And outside of the social aid programs, there's always apprenticeships and some that funding can come from some of these funding streams or other programs that you yourself as an employer may have. My name is Kendra Henry and I'm a veteran employment representative here at Job Service tips on how to move from just being a veteran foundry to being a veteran ready employer. Talk about culture shock. I'm going to show a video first. Hey, uh, Bill is sick today. Okay? So I just told him to stay home. You told him to what? I told him to stay home. He's got like five sick days. He's got five sick days? What the hell is a sick day? It's days we give to people for when they're sick so they don't come into work, but they still get paid. He's not working and he's still getting paid? Bring his computer to him at his house. That is Lieutenant Austin Van Kempman. He's known as Mandatory Fun Day Online. Um, he's an Army, currently an Army officer. And he pokes fun at military and veteran culture. He tends to provide very accurate and funny examples of veterans trying to adjust to the civilian workplace. When a service member is preparing to go to a different country, they receive a cultural awareness briefing. You'll learn about the, the country, the culture, religious norms, and maybe even parts of the language. This is to ease culture shock when they are experiencing, culture shock they may experience when going to another country and make it easier to hit the ground running and get their job done. There is no cultural awareness briefing for transitioning into the civilian workforce. But much like visiting a different country, they'll be in a new location, they'll be encountering a different workplace culture, and as we've already discussed, a completely different language. Not being prepared for this is an instance of culture shock that can impact adapting to the civilian workforce. 
Hey, uh, Bill is sick today. Sir, I'd like to use the bathroom. All right, uh, you're 32 and you don't need to call me sir. Just go use the bathroom. <sighs> what? If you don't know where I am, then we don't have accountability. <laughs> it's fine. You just go use the bathroom. It's in the same building as we're in. <sighs> I need a battle, buddy. <sighs> I don't want to get lost. What's going on? I don't want to be abducted. Imagine your boss knowing the last time you went to the dentist. What about being written up for how much you weigh? That new vacation you're on, that means you can't do certain parts of your job? Your whole office knows. You ever been called by your work at 2 a.m. just to make sure you'll answer the phone? When you submit vacation time, do you have to include maps and travel itineraries? All these things can impact military readiness. So yes, you might end up in a work center where you have to let somebody know when you use the restroom, especially when you're in somewhere more hostile. It may take time and mentorship for a recently served grade service member to adapt to your workplace culture. I know in my own experiences, my supervisor had to tell me that it was mandatory for me to take a lunch break. It sounds something silly, something ridiculous uh, this many years later, but in the military, they were not required to give me a lunch break. I would stay back and watch our phones while my subordinates went and got their meals because they were required to, because they had a meal card. Uh, so sometimes those old habits die hard. Speaking Sir, of which, um, in addition to military jargon being in a veteran's vocabulary, military behaviors don't die overnight. Things such as dressing the people as sir, ma'am, mister, and miss. Standing up when someone of authority approaches you in their workspace. I know this one, this one sometimes causes contention. Uh, maybe seems sexist of a man standing up for a woman. May cause confusion of a woman standing up for a man. Maybe people might stand very rigid or at parade rest when talking to someone. And usually veterans tend to be overdressed for, an, for the occasion. If your workplace doesn't have a strict uniform or dress code, a veteran may impose one on themselves. Quite often it can be a polo shirt and a good pair of jeans or slacks depending on the uh, workplace requirements. Um, but you may see them dressed nearly the same every single day because they're used to wearing a uniform. These kind of things may cause a veteran to appear standoffish, unapproachable, or mean and scary because these behaviors are derailed with the military member um, from day one as the way you're supposed to act. This is what professionalism looks like in the military and it will take a while to break those habits. But keep in mind these are meant out of respect and they're not supposed to be threatening. I turned 30 the year I left the military. For my entire adult life up to this point, I got paid at the 1st and the 15th. I lived in military housing, so the cost of rent and utilities was direct, deducted directly from my paycheck. I never had to worry about paying those bills. My annual doctor's appointments were either made for me or I was told, hey, make a phone call, make this appointment right now. I knew I was going to work every single day. Part of my work week required me to go to the gym. Planning for retirement was about making it to 20 years and not about having to put money into a plan. And my personal appearance was heavily regulated both on and off duty. When starting my first real job at age 31, uh, this meant I was unfamiliar with insurance plans, didn't have a retirement plan, and had to relearn what business casual meant and had to buy all new clothes. We may not know when we leave the military, we may have a lot of questions that are similar to what younger individuals have when they're starting out in the workforce, but we're not sure how to ask those questions. We may need more time and more explanation on signing up for your company's insurance policy explaining about how to invest in a retirement plan, just day-to-day -day workplace culture pieces. As I said before, this takes time, this takes mentorship. If you already have veterans in your organization, they will be more than happy to maybe assist with a new veteran coming into the workforce in a system of learning about that new culture and learning those different pieces. Keep that in mind as you are um, to hire these newly separated veterans.